right, everybody. Welcome back to our Friday night Bible study in the book of Daniel. We're cruising along in Daniel chapter 7. Maybe you think six months doesn't seem like we're cruising along when you're in the same chapter, but when you have a 400-page or 300-page syllabus, then that kind of makes more sense. Good to see everybody on Zoom, some new faces, people I haven't met. Glad you're on. Thanks for joining us. People, it's been a minute. Glad you're on. And uh, for those of you who are uh, tuning in via YouTube, we just want to thank you for uh, studying with us on YouTube and for sharing the videos. And uh, we're seeing the view counts go up. And that's because of uh, your guys' willingness to click a button and share the gospel. So we're just uh, really grateful for everybody that participates in this and uh, while we still can, right? You know, it's, it's, there's going to be a day when it's, we're not going to have YouTube or Zoom or whatever it is, right? And the, the, as we, as our brains grow in wisdom and knowledge from God's word, uh, we also want our faith and our courage to grow that we can study the Bible on our own, right? We're learning Bible study principles for us as individuals. As individuals, when we share it with others, you want to remember Daniel 11, you got to share it with somebody. Um, we've been doing the Daniel and Revelation classes for quite a few, a few years now since pandemic. So that's three years. And I get kind of confused at times and have to ask Paul, like, what are we studying again? Because it seems like we're going over the same thing over and over. And that's a good thing. Um, as we study, we become more familiar uh, with the content and with uh, what the Bible says. When we share it with other people, other people ask questions. You know, it's just a it's a way for us to to remember and apply it in our lives. And then people see us living it. Uh, Ellen White, I'm going to paraphrase here, but she said the only way a Christian can grow is by sharing their faith. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. It's probably in one of our studies that we've done. I know it is, Paul. But in order for us, like part of the sanctifying process, part of conversion is that we witness, you know, so you can't just take this information and keep it for yourself. You become like the body of water called the Dead Sea, which we've talked about. You know, it doesn't the Dead Sea doesn't give give its water and then everything there. Um, dies, you know, but you see how it's how it's fed. So you are a fountain of water. So you have to share this. And don't think, well, I need to understand everything before I can share. That's not that's the way you learn is by sharing. it. Somebody's going to ask you a question you've never heard before. Um, you can never be uh, you'll never feel prepared. I'll tell you that um, from experience to study to to do Bible studies with people. I, mean, I told you that when I was at Amazing Facts and they told us we were had to go knock on people's doors. I was like, I am going back home. I did not sign up to go knock on people's doors doing Bible studies. That wasn't on your website uh, when I when I signed up. This is in 2001. And then, you know, the story a few days later, I'm knocking on somebody's door giving Bible studies. So um, that's the way we learn these things. We've got to share it with others. All right. Good to see a couple other people. Um, Come in. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, we're on page 143 in our syllabus. We're still studying Daniel chapter 11. Let's pray and we'll go ahead and get started with our study. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for giving us the strength to endure another day. And we're just so grateful that we can come together uh, through technology. We know that, that this ability is, is a blessing uh, from you that we can study together. We know the day's coming when we're not going to have this. And we want to use this time to grow our faith and our, our courage and our strength in you, that we would trust with all our hearts in you. We wouldn't lean on our own understanding. Uh, so we're so grateful for what we're about to learn today as we continue studying about the scattering and the gathering, um, how you are as God and how much you love us. And Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you love us, that we want to pray for Vivian, and we pray in Jesus name because uh, it's it's how this is all possible. We just want to pray for Pastor Rudy and for Vivian uh, for for her health. Uh, 
we're grateful you're in control. Help us to believe that. But yeah, we want to see her healed. We want to see her um, active again. And, and we know Pastor Rudy's got a flock to shepherd and, and a wife to be by uh, whose side he needs to be by. So we just ask for special strength and um, whatever it is they need. We know that you you love them more than we ever could and, and uh, that you have them in your hands. So help us to have faith in that and continue to, to pray. Uh, thank you for the lessons that you're teaching us as individuals. As we study your word, will you bless us with the Holy Spirit so we can understand what we're studying, why it's important for us as individuals, and that we would be bold and share this with people because we love people. We love people the way Jesus loves us. Please protect us from evil and distraction, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. 143. Picking up where we left off. Now, we talked about, in our previous study, scattering and gathering. We're Seem, seems like we're always learning, but we get this another perspective of the same thing. I hope you guys are understanding that and embracing that of how God works. Now, let me ask you a question just so we're on the same page. You can nod, blink twice, or raise your digital hands or make comments in the chat room, whatever it is. Do all people bear fruit? Okay, took some of y'all a few. That's all right. I, I, I liked it, though, because I could tell the thought was going through your head. You're like, well, yeah, we do. Look, everybody bears fruit. People either bear good fruit or they bear bad fruit. OK, and whatever fruit you bear, the people around you eat. Does that make sense? So we, we see that uh, the Bible tells us by their fruits, you will know them. Right. So we're not to judge hearts. I'm not getting into a study on that, but we do judge what we see, don't we? We judge on the outward. So we see something, we're like, this is what it is. So how important is it that we make sure that we know what fruit? Um, where you can't have good and bad fruit. That's that's the Laodicean mentality, the gray area, the walking the middle of the line or on the fence, all those expressions that Jesus does not accept. It's biblical. Vomit you out of, out of his mouth. So it says in Revelation chapter 3 talking about Laodicea. You're lukewarm, right? So we we either bear good fruit or we bear bad fruit. Whatever fruit we bear, people eat. Now, in regards to scattering and gathering, you either scatter or gather. Okay, so we're either gathering people to God or we're scattering people away from God. Jesus says, if I, I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So that's why whenever we share the Bible, we need to lift up Jesus because when Jesus is lifted up, his word says he will draw all men to him, right? It's not because of anything that inherently that we have, but when Jesus is lifted up, people are drawn or gathered in. So these are things to help motivate us. And as we go through each day of our own lives as individuals, let's not forget what kind of fruit am I bearing right now? And hey, when you recognize your barren bad fruit, praise God. Thank you for revealing that to me. Please give me the strength I need now to overcome that, right? The victory is always there. The, the victory is there. It's up to us whether or not we want it. So we need that strength to obtain the victory, right? Jesus, he gave the victory to the whole world. The whole world has access to victory over all of our our faults and our, our shortcomings and all of that stuff because of what he did for us, the life he lived, the death he died, what he does now in the sanctuary. Um, but remember, we battle the flesh and the spirit, right? The flesh is the world. The flesh is the bad fruit, okay? And we battle. It's a real, it's a real battle. Jesus has been through everything that we could ever imagine going through. He's been tempted in every way we have. And look, when we fail, we need to remember that Jesus bore that on the cross, our failure, our literal failure, right? So when we have those moments or whatever it is, Jesus, he can tru truthfully say, I've been through everything you've been through. And then he knows it intimately because 
our sin is what he bore on the cross if we um, accept him as as our god right and it's a very real thing isn't it when you think like we think oh christ died for all oh he died for my sins or whatever it's like no your sins were on him our sins were on him and that's a different mentality you know when when we think about that you know so that's how personal our savior is you know he truly understands because he bore our guilt our shame you know the good news is he doesn't want us to stay feeling guilty we recognize our shortcomings we thank the lord that the spirit's battling with the flesh lord give me the strength to overcome fill in the blank right whatever that moment that lifestyle whatever it is lord give me the strength to to uh grab the victory that you've provided you know so when we study these things, as we go through this in our study work, this is really what we want to do. We want to look at ourselves. We want to examine ourselves because it's very easy to separate ourselves from the Bible, right? Like, oh, this story is about Daniel. Oh, this is about Nebuchadnezzar. This has nothing to do with me. That's not the case. The Bible is for every person. Every example we have in here is for us as individuals. It's not story time, right? It's historical it's actual happenings, events that took place so that we could learn from it. So we either gather to Jesus or we scatter. So recognize, am I, do I scatter people? Lord, give me the strength to overcome that. I don't want to scatter people. And God's not going to say, no. Isn't that great? My God wants us to succeed. He wants us to overcome. It's just up to us whether or not we want to do it. We don't do it on our own. God doesn't do it for us. We do it together because of what God has done um, with his son, Jesus. Okay. Um, are you high-fiving me? Okay, the hand went away. All right. Or are you, are you volunteering to read the first text? Because maybe Bert's saying like, come on, Ben, we still haven't read anything in our syllabus. Uh, all right, Bert, uh, unless the dog's barking, your, uh, your delusional dog there uh, that you have. How about Matthew 18, verse 20? For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. What a great verse. You know, um, and I, I see Don's on here. I got I got to shout out, Don, to the sermon that that God uh, spoke through you when you he did a sermon on uh, two or three a long, long time ago. Um Maybe you could print out the study so we could share it with people. But that verse was one of the big, uh, big part of it. You know, two or three gathered. He gave this illustration. I'm going to use this. Um, think about when you're, if two of us were standing in front of each other, right? And we held each other's hands. We're connected. And then another person, a third person comes in and we hold each other's hand. Each person's connected to the other person. But if you brought a fourth person in, now you're actually separated, you know, from, from that person. The intimate, uh, and I know I'm probably butchering a little bit, Dom, but I know you're talking about the intimacy, you know, of two or three. And the Bible specific, two or three. Sometimes we said where two or more are gathered together. No, it says two or three are gathered together. There I am in the midst of them. First paragraph here on 143, in the Christian dispensation, the Holy Land is where two or three gather in Christ's name. That's to say we have to understand Israel today is spiritually and relationally and the land globally. So we're having that added perspective on literal local. So we look as we've studied in Daniel, literal local Babylon, literal uh, localized Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, right? And then the Medes and the Persians. But all of that's pointing to the global spiritual. That's the time we're in now. So when we look at the Bible, how does this mean anything to me now these events that took place noah and the ark or moses in egypt what does that have to do with me well now you've got to apply what happened in a literal local part of the world and in earth's history as spiritually and globally today zion or jerusalem is not in the middle east now you may say yes it is jerusalem's in the middle east look jerusalem was pancaked by the romans in 70 a.d read about it you guys got in your books on that Josephus wrote, he witnessed it. You know, there's a lot of uh, Ellen White, 
uh, writes in Great Controversy, the very first chapter about the destruction of Jerusalem, and she quotes Josephus, you know, who who uh, was a, who witnessed uh, these things that uh, take place. It was pancaked, and then another, you know, just look at the Dark Ages, right? I got to do the air quotes. Christians, I don't know their hearts, judge them by their fruits, warred with Muslims over who was going to have Jerusalem and, you know, the whose site was it to be holy and all these things. So when it's talking about Zion and Jerusalem, um, this is not in the Middle East here. What's being talked about. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was laid waste um, and hasn't been and will not be uh, a temple again on earth for anything God, right? Jesus fulfilled all those uh, ceremonial and uh, feast days, all those kind of things. Again, that's a different study. Uh, it's where Jesus is, and Jesus is in two places. What? Jesus is in two places. All right. Well, is he is he present spiritually in the in the spiritual temple? What is the spiritual temple? Well, it's the church, right? What makes up what makes up the uh, the church, the people, right? Do I have to do the little kid thing? I will. I do it a lot. You know, the church, here's the steeple, open it up, see all the people, right? That's the thing. That's that's how the church is built up. And it's on in the temple. Where's the church at on earth? It's everywhere. Wherever people are, that's where the temple is, right? Where does the gospel go to? These are the texts where all the ones that we were constantly saying, the gospel shall go to every nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, that's because people cover the face of the planet, right? So anybody who has Jesus in their heart, Jesus is there with them. Now you can see Second Thessalonians. Uh, don't forget to download the syllabus for those of you on YouTube. It's in our description. Uh, we're on page 143. Sorry, I just saw the, the chat. Oh, and I saw Hoku's already replied to it. So um, I'm like that guy that reads the teleprompter, you know, and then reads the punctuation. I'm Ben Van Fossen. Um, you know, it's uh thanks a bunch. All right, I'm just reading all the messages. Let me get that cleared out so uh so I don't have to look at those anymore. Uh there's a literal temple. Where is Jesus now physically? He's interceding as high priest. Did Jesus ascend to heaven after he resurrected 40 days on earth and then he he ascends to heaven? literally into a literal temple the real one by the way is you know the the temples that were on earth you know that moses built the wilderness tabernacle ultimate tent temple the one that solomon built and then it was rebuilt um you know those temples were mirrors and shadows and types of the only one in true temple in heaven. If God gave it to man on earth, it's because it copies and mirrors something that's in heaven. You with me? So look, the temple's small on earth. The temple was small. And, you know, some people uh, listed Solomon's temple as one of the wonders of the world. It's like, imagine if they could even have a glimpse of what the temple in heaven's like that God gets in his chariot and goes from the holy place to most holy place. That fiery streams issue before him, which are the angelic host moving uh, Jesus uh, into the most holy place with, with his father, that all the angelic host would be able to, I don't want to say fit in there, but look, everybody's in there. We, I have not seen, nor has your ear heard, nor has your mind or your heart even come close to anything that God has um, for us, what he's done for us, what he's doing for us, and what he will be. That's a cool promise. It's a cool text. In the literal temple, though, that's where Jesus is literally in heaven. On the other hand, we're in the heavenly temple spiritually. And in the future, we will be in the heavenly temple literally. Okay? The context of Matthew 18, 20 you can read verses 15 through 19 as well. Indicates that if a person does not gather to Jesus, he is what? He is a spiritual Gentile. 
you know, a lot of people get caught up on the, you know, is this person a Jew? There's a man, you know, the tribe split up uh, long before Jerusalem was, was destroyed uh, the first time, I believe. And there's this idea, there's these maps online. Don't waste your time. But it's like this country's this tribe. Like it breaks down the world, you know, like these people are from the tribe of Judah. And this person, maybe you've seen them, you know, if you watch the news at all, you know, some political rally, there'll be somebody there and they'll say, we're the descendants of such and such a tribe. Look, the tribes don't mean anything literally to us now, do they? And we've read these texts in Galatians and uh, where Paul says, we're not all we're not all uh, Jews who are Jews, right? We're not Jews uh, outward, outwardly, but circumcisions of the heart, right? The Jewish people were, were Jesus's vessel, chosen vessel to share the gospel to the world. The Jewish nation was cut off at the stoning of Stephen. We've talked about this and studied it. And the message, the gospel would now be preached to the ends of the earth. It would be preached to the Gentiles. So these were people who weren't part of the chosen um, mouthpiece for God in, in the Jewish nation, all right? But Jews now, should, should we be Jews, any of us? It's a weird thing, right? Well, we're supposed to inwardly, in what manner? In that we are cooperative vessels with God. Does that make sense? Circum can your heart be circumcised? Can you circumcise a heart and a circumcision? No, it was a literal thing done in literal Israel. Um, circumcisions of the heart um, shows that we have chosen to give um, and to cooperate with God. God, remember, he doesn't make us do anything, and we can't do anything of ourselves. It's a co-op, and I think that's cool because sometimes uh, we need to be reminded that, that we're working together with God. He's not going to force his way. That's not who God is. Um, he's not going to. And if we sit around and do nothing, oh, God, figure this out for me. Come on. Like we walk together. How can two agree unless they walk together? Right. So that's a biblical principle. So as we talk about spiritual Gentiles, what's that saying? That's a person who has not put their trust in God. You get to choose that. You don't have to follow God. He wants you to because he wants all of us to be saved. So if it's possible for, is it, is it also possible though, if you are a spiritual Gentile, in other words, you're a non-believer, that's what that means, to become a spiritual Jew or to become a believer. Here's the text, see, I didn't even look ahead. I didn't even say Galatians, this is the Holy Spirit. Let's read this text. Let's have somebody volunteer. This is in Galatians, open up your Bibles, New Testament, uh, Galatians chapter four, verses 21 through 31. Terry, I saw your hand. Galatians, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and then go eat peaches and cream that totally taste tasty Titus. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. That's how I remember it. Some people like popcorn. All right, Terry, do you have it? Galatians 4, 10 verses, verses 21 through 31. Okay. Yeah, is that start? Tell me. Galatians 4, 21 through 31. Go ahead. Get my, I'm getting my magnifying glass out. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Okay. 24, 21 to 31. Right. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scripture say that Abraham had two sons one from his slave wife and one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman represents Mount Sinai, where people received the law that enslaved them 
And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia because she and her children live in slavery to the law. But the other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, rejoice, O childless woman, you who are never given birth, break into a joyful shout, you who have never been in labor. For the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power and the spirit. And what do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the freed woman. Thank you, Terry. Let's have somebody else read 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 1 20. 2 Corinthians Oku. One verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, right? That's correct. Okay, cool. Sorry, it took me a minute to get there. No worries. All right. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. And then let's read Galatians. Go back to Galatians. And Hoku, if you want to read these two, since you're still unmuted. What's Galatians now? We're going to be the chapter before what uh, Terry read. Um, so Galatians 3, verses 16, 28, and 29. Got it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is which is Christ. You said, what was the other two? Sorry. 28 and 29. 28 and 29, sorry. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, thank you, Hoku, for reading that. Look, um, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Well, when Paul was writing this, were there Jews and Greeks? Um, are there still Jews and Greeks to this day? Uh, there's neither slave or free. Are there people that are in bondage and people that are free? We got to address this because people are taking this text out of con uh, this text out of context in today's day and age. It says there's neither male or female. Are there male and females? Yes. What is he saying here? You're all one in Christ Jesus. So no matter who you are, where you're from, whether you're male or female, where how you were brought up, doesn't matter. You're all Christ's seed. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. So he's Remember who the audience and who he's talking to as well. Look, let's do some simple, can we call this Bible math? I feel like we can call it Bible. I don't know. So, you know, people who think, well, you come through whatever uh, tribe. Well, where did those tribes come from? So let's back up. Okay. And you can read it in the Bible. You can see, you know, where they come from. They come from, uh, they come from Isaac. They come from Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, right? Did Abraham have a, did he have a dad, right? What we call a pappy. Did his grandpappy have a pappy, right? That's what we talk about. Look, it goes back to, well, there was Noah and his three sons and their wives. Look, if you go all the way back in genealogies, we all come from Adam and Eve. So let's not get hung up on what blood's running through our veins 
you know, some of us are obsessed with not people on this, but like the world with the, you know, got to know where I came from, right? Got to, got to donate my DNA to find out who I, who I might be related to. Look, Jesus is saying it doesn't matter who you're related to. Like we're all one in Jesus. That's such a great promise. And mark that in your Bible. So when somebody tries to bring up, well, no, you've got to be from this tribe. No, you literally don't. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from. Um, if you're one in Jesus, look, you're, you're heirs to the promise that was promised to Abraham. I think we've done studies on this. You can also see in Romans 4, uh, more on that. When we accept Christ, all the promises become ours in him, right? We have nothing to offer except for what Jesus has offered us, which is, by the way, the best thing um, that anybody can have. Do, what do we have to offer God, people? What do our Bibles say? What do we offer? Filthy rags. Ouch, right? How, are, how does... Uh, what condition are our hearts in deceitful above all things? The Bible says, Whoa, do we have any light inherently that shines out that we can give to God? No, all the glory and the light comes from God. The good news is you want to know why is Jesus so important? It's his merits. It's his love that makes all things possible, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. With man, it's impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. We see these texts over and over. It shows that cooperation, but that everybody has access to the same Savior. All right, let me read some comments. God is not partial to who he loves. We all come from Noah, and then some, right? Don't even before that, but you're right. There's only, there's only eight people alive on, after the flood. Your Bible says it. Um, but yes, it doesn't give us any benefit. That's right, Terry. Like what, what makes it possible for us to be part of God's family? It's Jesus. Now, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father because I and the father are one. That's great news. That shows us who God is and that God loves us, but it's a decision we have to make whether we accept that or reject it. It's totally up to you. It's up to me, right? What Christ has done, yes, what he's doing and what he will do. This is why we study the Bible. Look at what Jesus has done for us. Study. We're talking about what he's doing for us now so that we can be ready for um, what he has prepared for us. Being grafted in, another good expression. Yeah, thanks, guys, for, for sharing all that. Okay, let's keep going to the next page. Jesus relived the history of Israel and was victorious where they failed. When we accept Christ, his victorious history becomes ours. <laughs> Do you get it? There's a text, maybe somebody can type in the chat where he says, uh, where we're, I think Paul tells us to put on Christ. Let this mind be in you. That also is in Christ. Look, when we accept Jesus, check this out. Does the father love his son? Does he accept his son? He accepted the life he lived on earth, the sacrifice that he made, and uh, that's a fun study. And Jesus now stands before the Father. Remember the high priest? He could only go in once a year, and he had to be sinless to go before God, before the uh, the Shekinah glory in the most holy place, or else he would cease to exist. Right. So, is the Father pleased with Jesus? Yes, Jesus is in the presence of his Father. When we put on Christ, when we accept him in every way, when we've got the mind in us that was in Christ, how do you think the Father will receive us? Just like he receives his Son. Isn't that awesome? And it's not that we're, you're not fooling God because he discerns the heart. He sees the depths of us. But when we when we imitate Christ, it's when Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When we imitate Christ, who are we imitating? We're also imitating the Father. 
that like blows my mind, right? Because I feel so uh, not even small, so unworthy. That's the love story, right? How much does Jesus love us? Well, all we have are filthy rags and a deceitful heart. And Jesus says, um, you can put me on, you know, and uh, the mind that I have, I, you know, I can put in you. Remember when David said, uh, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. That's should be our prayer every day. Right. And Jesus doesn't say, well, let me think about it. He says, yes, it's exactly what I want to do. Then we know what it is um, to walk in a manner that's pleasing to God. When we accept Christ, his victory becomes ours. Therefore, we inherit the covenant promises in him. The promises that were given to Abraham, it's the same promise, right? Old covenant, new covenant. Did God change? No. People changed, right? Where the law was written, I'll write them in your hearts. You know, he tells us in Ezekiel, I'll pull out your stony heart. Put on a heart of flesh where my law can be written, where you can embrace it. Those who reject Christ cannot inherit the promises because they are outside of him. Look, if like whoever's in heaven is there because they chose to be. So if you want to be in heaven, choose to be there. If you're not in heaven, it's because you chose not to be in heaven. You guys with me? Probably because you hear me say this every week. Hey, this is where the repetition is good. It's not mindless repetition. We're constructively thinking here. But look, every day. I'm going to choose God. We're told by Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. Every time we wake up, who are you going to serve? God's not going to reject you if you accept him and choose him as your God. Now, Ephesians 1, and I think it's just verse 10 that's in your syllabus. So uh, you got to get your syllabus and, and fix your stuff. Savannah can't do it all for us here. Come on, people. But be thankful for Savannah. In correcting a lot of these typos. But Ephesians 1 9, let's have somebody read, or Ephesians 1 10, let's have somebody read. Bert, if you'll read the text, please. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Zechariah. 13.7 contains a remarkable prophecy about the scattering of the disciples when the temple guard arrested Jesus. Let's have somebody else read this and the next Bible verse, uh, Liesl. And I'm going to run because I forgot to plug my computer in and the battery wants to die. So while you read that, <clears throat> I'll be right back. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. And then Matthew 26, 30 and 31 says, Then Jesus said to them all, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Okay, thank you for reading that slower. So I could have enough time to plug in my computer. I'm like, why did my screen just go really dim? Power saving mode. Thank you. A remarkable prophecy about the scattering of the disciples when the temple guard arrested Jesus. Uh, is that what happened? Jesus said uh, to them, uh, all of you who will be made st stubble uh, because of me, made to stumble because of me this night, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Uh, the evidence is when Jesus was smitten, who was there helping him out? Nobody. You know, we, and we say, well, you know, his mom was there and, you know, John was there. Yes, there were people there at the foot of the cross. Um, but when Jesus was being, who was with him when he was in the temple getting um, with his uh, unjust, now that I plugged it in, Paul wants to do all the uh, updates. So forgive me for being a little scatterbrained, people. That's what it was waiting for. Now I know how to get around the automatic updates. Don't plug in your computer. Um, but we see this with what Jesus went through. Let me, when we suffer, how often do we feel alone? Right? Have you ever said, like, God, I'm alone in this? Really, all the time, don't we? 
you've left me alone. There's nobody to talk to, or, you know, it's very interesting. Are we, are we going to suffer like Christ suffered? Well, we are. It's what the Bible says, you know, but we suffer. Our suffering is for a refining process, a, a burnishing process um, for us, but it's, it's, shouldn't be that hard for us to understand this text that says, you know, strike the shepherd, the, the sheep will be scattered um, because we often go through the hardest times in our lives where we feel by ourselves. You know, the people that we were closest to aren't close to us anymore. They don't even want to talk. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's best friends, you know, you've known from, um, from when you were a little kid and all of a sudden when the going gets rough, right? Everybody, everybody leaves. And then imagine that on a level of Christ where he ended up being separated from his father. It, we should just be in awe of Jesus, really, with all of this. But the good thing is, Jesus tells us, I will not forsake you. Okay, so when we feel alone, guess who's there? Jesus is. You know why he's there? Because he said he'd be there. It has nothing to do with your feelings. And it's okay. I do it all the time. I say, Lord, I'm, I don't feel like you're there, but I know you're there. It doesn't feel like it. Help me get over my, my feelings. You know, thank you that you're saying you are there, even though I'm struggling. The day of Pentecost, back to 144, his scattered disciples did what? They gathered together, all in one accord. You can see that in Acts. Isaiah 43, 5 through 7 contains a magnificent gathering prophecy that Jesus alluded to in Luke 13, 28. Through 30. I believe all the Bible is prophecy because I look at how it's always fulfilled, you know, in, uh, in my life or other people's lives around me. But notice what he says here. This, this is kind of what I was uh, alluding to. Uh, fear not, for I am with you. Who's he telling not to fear? Who's he saying? Why am I having a hard time with that? Like, the, who's he talking to? Come on, Paul. Turn on the mic. He's been a long day. He's uh, it's all that black mold that we were tearing out. He's talking to us, right? Fear not. I meant to say that. I just couldn't think of a witty way to do it. Fear not, for I am with you. Who's with us? God is. Based on what? Well, that's what he said. It has nothing to do with your feelings, right? Look, if you don't, if you if you don't feel that that I've forsaken you, then, you know, then you're, you're good. No, I will bring your descendants from the East and gather you from the West. I'll say to the North, give them up and to the South. Don't keep them back. By the way, that covers your whole compass, right? Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. Does God have sons and daughters throughout the ends of the earth? Or are they all in Israel? No. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. Who did God create? Every one of us. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Why does God love you? Well, he is love. He created us. He didn't create us arbitrarily, did he? And it's going to create stuff and then and then uh, abandon them. The uh, what's up, Prof? One of the recent ones was called the absentee God or something like that. What is it? It's the beard, Hoku. I feel like I can read your lips, but I can't stop staring at your beard. But he knows the the absentee Lord. Is that what you're saying? Now you're unmuted. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize no, I was, right. the absentee landlord. Yeah. All right, landlord. I was getting close. Absentee yeah, landlord. Sorry, the beard was slapping a little bit. <laughs> I was, I was trying to yell beard. it so loud. It is an impressive beard. But uh, just... <laughs> God's not an absentee landlord. He's he's look, he's not only is he not sitting up there arbitrarily, he's in the most holy place with his son. There, and you know what they're you know what they're discussing? This earth. Do you know what's taking place? Uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the judgment of uh, beginning at his house of this earth. Man, I think Paul's the one who writes. He says that this earth is a spectacle. 
And that's the Greek word is theater. To the universe. All eyes are on this planet. You know what the world tells you? There's no God. Nobody cares. We're left here out, uh, all by ourselves. That is not biblical. All eyes are on this planet. And the very thing that's taking place now in the real temple, in real heaven, with the real father and the real son, is real judgment for his real church and for the people of this planet. It says also in comment, uh, he has us as representatives here on earth. Yes, he is not a tyrant. Anybody tries to talk to you, talk bad about God to you, open up the Bible and show them what the Bible says about God. That's how we know who God is. Absentee, yeah, yeah, Josh, uh, absentee, absent landlords do not have the hairs of your head numbered. That's right. That's a very good point. And you guys are typing text in there. I see Isaiah 55, 11, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Um, check those out. Let me keep going here. Matthew, no, you uh, at least read that one. Oh, Day of Pentecost. No, oh, we read the text. Hey, I'm on another page. I went so fast on that page, I surprised myself. All right, we're on uh, page 145 at the top here. This gathering to Christ began its fulfillment on the day of Pentecost when believers in Christ from 13 different nations gathered with one accord and received the Holy Spirit. Let's have somebody read. This is Acts chapter 2. Uh, verse 1 and then 7 through 11. It's in your syllabus as well. Uh, Hoku, I got gotcha. you. If you'll go ahead and read that text, please. When the day of Pentecost had finally come, they were all with one accord in one place. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear, each in our own language, in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygeria and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Thank you, Hoku. Last week, I think I went over this, so I'm going to briefly mention it. Psalm 133, one of my favorite psalms, because it, uh, it was type and anti-type, where David talks about um, the anointing of the high priest Aaron. And he says uh, in Psalm 133, it's only got, I think, three or four verses in the whole chapter. But it begins, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to do what? Dwell together in unity and then he describes the anointing of Aaron and we talked about that so if you uh, weren't on our last study um, go through that because I spend a few minutes I'm um, talking about how that was fulfilled at the day of Pentecost this is actually pointing to the day of Pentecost you know we talk about being in unity but we just talk about it don't we you know it's a you know when we go to the anchor program every year one of the best parts of the anchor program is us having to be under the same roof. It's a, it's look, it's a blessing, but it's a different experience, isn't it? When it's, I mean, we're talking people all over and we're under the same roof. And then at the end of the week, we're like, I want to do it again. You know? And it's like, it, and it always takes a few days for people to kind of get comfortable, like talking. It's always kind of quiet. And then by midweek to end week, you know, we're already dreading the, the week's almost over, but it's so nice and it's refreshing, you know, to be in unity, um, to be together. You know, in Exodus, before the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 and Exodus chapter 19, um, you can read through that chapter, but the whole camp of Israel was gathered together. And they were like in awe and fear because the mountain, uh, you know, there was quaking and and uh, there is fire and all these, you know, just amazing supernatural things that take place every time God um, is present. The lightnings and the thundering, um, all these things that, that took place, but everybody was together. You have a type of Pentecost there. Notice the, uh, let's go to page 146. Lisa, adult Bible summer camp. <laughs> hey, the next one's in Fresno. So uh, if you haven't been to Fresno in the spring, it's awesome summer not awesome spring 
Awesome. According to Isaiah 49, 6, God intended that Israel should be the medium through which to reach the world. Let's have somebody read this text. This is in your syllabus, or you can have your Bible open up. Mom, saw your hand. Go ahead, please. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. Thank you for reading that. Look, when we talk about, I had somebody ask me once, and it was a good question. It says, why were the Jews the chosen nation? How come the Egyptians weren't the chosen nation? And other uh, empires or nations, right? Not, not chosen. It's like they... And this is where the old covenant, where we see the old covenant, um, but we also see why they failed. It says, when God says, I will be your God and you will be my people, right? And they said that, that all these things we will do. And that's where they went wrong because they thought they could do things on their own, right? Um, that's, that's the old covenant. But they chose to be the mouthpiece for God. To do what? What does Isaiah say here? To receive the gospel? To receive light to keep them to themselves? No, it's to a light to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? AKA non-believers. Why does the why does the good news, why does the message have to go to non-believers? Because God wants everybody in his kingdom. And he's, Jesus isn't going to come until every choice has been made, every heart's been decided for. So the reason Israel was a chosen nation, they were chosen. And to be God's mouthpiece, they accepted. How did they do? Well, historically, they failed. Now, if you're like, man, what's wrong with you, Israel? I want you to go walk into your bathroom and look in the mirror and be like, man, what's wrong with you, Ben? Right? We're the same. We're the weakest link in the chain, aren't we? This is why it's important for us to, to believe and trust in the cooperation with God. We can do all things through Christ, who strengthens us. And his salvation goes to all the ends of the earth. Look, we, we're bringing this up. We're putting focus on this, not looking at the Middle East because that's the futuristic dispensationalist perspective of um, what's going to happen in the end. It's not biblical. Now, if you say, dumb that down a little bit for us. Look, God has people all over the world that have the gospel and that need to hear the gospel. Jesus comes for everybody, no matter what nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. That you are. That gospel goes to the ends of the earth, he says in Matthew 24. Then the end will come. You want Jesus to come? Let's not be the weak link. Click a button, share the gospel, right? In Acts 13, 46 and 47, the apostle Paul quoted Isaiah 49, 6, because most of the New Testament is Old Testament. You can't separate the two. There's no such thing as an Old Testament Christian and a New Testament Christian. You got to have both testaments. He applied it to the ingathering of the Gentiles. The church, spiritual Israel, was now to fulfill the commission that God gave to ancient Israel. Whose job is it to fulfill the commission? Look, it, it's the very last verse in, in the Gospels. Go ye therefore, right? Teaching, baptizing to every person on the end of the earth, right? The message goes to everybody. God didn't reject Israel. He rejected the Jewish theocracy. As the, he rejected the Jewish theocracy as the means to reach the world with the gospel. Look, can anybody share the gospel? How cool is that? Yes. How cool is that? Anybody can share the gospel. Can you share the gospel? Well, you better be sharing the gospel. That's why we're on here. In the Old Testament, God's plan was for the nations to come to Israel's light. Isaiah 60, verse 3. And inherit, as a result, inherit God's blessings. In the New Testament, the plan was for the church to go to all the nations. You see here, 
the nations were to come to Israel. Hey, did they do that with Solomon? Man, he had all the leaders coming from all over the world, didn't he? They wanted a, a, little, a little bit of that wisdom. The nations came to Israel, didn't they? Unfortunately, Israel played, played the harlot, cheated on God. And now the church goes to all the nations. It's like a chiastic structure. Isn't that beautiful? What's the purpose of the church going to all the nations? So we can gather them together to Jesus, to the spiritual holy land, the church, not the Middle East. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy, this is an ax, of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. It's like, look, you're not doing your job. So we're going to give it to people who want to do it. For the Lord, for so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's where Paul in Acts 13 is quoting Isaiah 49, verse 6. Okay, a couple of minutes left. It says, what makes persons true Israelites is not that they gather to the Holy Land, but rather to the Holy Lord. If they gather in the Holy Land, but reject the Holy Lord, how does God view them? They're scattered. Look, you reject the Lord, you're scattered. The land was holy. Why? Because God was there. God wasn't there because the land was holy. All right, I'll bite my tongue because we're at a we're at a we're almost out of time. I had I thought I had a witty remark. I'll save it for the after study. With the previous remarks in mind, we need to return to the prophecy of Isaiah 11. This is where I'll end. This symbolic interpretation of Edom, Moab, and Ammon in Isaiah, remember this goes all the way back now to Daniel chapter 11, the text we're studying, finds corroboration in the prophecy about Edom in Amos 9, verse 11 and 12. We'll end with this. It says, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. It's because of the Babylonian captivity. And repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. So that's the, the gathering after the captivity. Verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of who? Of Edom. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. You can take it to the bank because he says it. Continue reading on. I'm going to put a mark in my syllabus. We're going to pick up... Um, where James talks about this prophecy at the Jerusalem Council in the year 49 AD. So put a mark on page 147. But look, is this making sense when we, as we study Daniel chapter 11, it's much more than, than just uh, historical events, you know, just to, just to have uh, that we can rattle off to people. Like we want to point to how this is applied to us as individuals. Like what is Jesus telling us? when we look at this amazing chapter in, the, in Daniel and we read these texts in regards to uh, Edom and Moab and Ammon, there's a lot more to it, isn't there? You know, these are all heart issues uh, that Jesus is, is uh, tugging on here with us as individuals. We get to learn from history, but it's still the same message coming from Jesus. He's like, man, I want you. I want you in my kingdom. And you, by the way, Jesus is the son of God. If we're sons and daughters of God, that makes Jesus our brother. And again, it just, that's uh, pretty cool how, um, how God works there. So, okay, let's put a mark. We'll go ahead and um, pick up here next week. And I don't think I saw Doug. So, Paul, you're your father's son. If you'll close in prayer, please. Let's bow our heads. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day that has come in. Lord, we thank you for this time that we get to gather together and draw closer to you and study your word. And uh, we just thank you for this, this opportunity. Um, Father, we pray that we will all be gatherers, that your spirit will Amen. guide us in all that we say and do. Um, we pray that all we say and do would bring honor and glory to you. Father, we uh, pray for your uh, wisdom, your protection, your angels to be with us tomorrow as we 
head into church. Um, we just thank you for the many blessings that you continue to provide. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness towards us. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Good to see you. God bless you. And we'll see you next week.